Welcome back to the coolest community in freight. I'm your host, Mary O'Connell, bringing you the latest tech updates, warehouse news, and everything in between happening in the cold chain world. Not only is there our coolest show in freight, there's also running on ice the newsletter that could not be colder. You can subscribe to that on freightwaves.com slash running on ice. Before we get into our interview, let's get into some headlines. Report Linker just published some research that indicates that the refrigerated transportation market market will reach $25.88 billion in 2028. The high prevalence of various foodborne diseases, disorders are expected to propel the damage, the demand for refrigerated transport for food distribution globally to maintain the safety of food products. Worldwide reefer transportation markets were at $17.86 billion in 2022. The advancements in refrigerated transport technology have improved food safety, reduced food waste, energy usage, and a low environmental influence. The ongoing supply chain challenges facing major ports in the U.S. are and the high demand for cold storage is driving investment in capacity, but the continued challenges are unlikely to go away anytime soon. A panel at the National Fisheries Institute Global Seafood Market Conference is uh, has said that there is a death of just-in-time model of the supply chain. Some are recommending a shift in port access for cargo shipped from overseas as the analysts predict capacity issues and will continue to plague storage and cold shipping in the U.S. However, not in the U.S. On the other side of the world, in the Philippines, there is a shortage of cold chain solutions that is causing onions to rot and go bad due to the lack of proper storage. Often referred to as an onion disaster, Filipino Department of Agriculture is attempting to rectify this issue with six new cold storage facilities built in onion producing regions where each facility will be able to hold at least 20,000 bags of onions. I did not know that there was such a strong onion shortage, but turns out there is. Um, So getting into some of our specific topics that we have today, where cold chain can be one of those things where, you know, you have a lot of waste and there's not really a good way to mitigate some of that risk. So some of the risk that comes with it, you know, it could be something like your insurance liabilities, um, you know, trying to make ensure that your technology is great. It's just kind of an all-encompassing, where do we start? Well, it'll really kind of start with, you know, what kind of products are you shipping? Are you looking to maybe have some, um, are you doing mostly food? Are you doing beverage? Are you doing pharmaceutical? It really just kind of depends on what you're looking for. So leading leaning into that, um, cold, cold chain it does produce one of the largest amounts of waste. And it's kind of common because there, I mean, if you think about it, if something has to stay at a specific temperature, it really is going to be difficult to, you know, if something happens to that, that specific temperature, then you're going to have, then you lose your product. So really kind of knowing Investing in that technology where, you know, maybe you have some of that reefer visibilities, where you have some of those, that data that you can then harvest from some of those old temperature logs to make sure that, you know, you are keeping things at a reliable scent and you can make sure that reefers are staying at the correct temperature and catching problems before they become problem before they become big problems. So This is kind of different compared to your dry van loads because the dry van loads, you know, it doesn't really matter if its sweater gets left out in 100 degree heat versus um, being left in a negative 20 degree weather. It doesn't necessarily overly impact um, that is. So to start talking about some of those mitigations of um, some of those issues that you have in freight, we have Ivan Castro from PackSafe here. So to talk about that and kind of bring us all the knowledge. Welcome to the show, Ivan. Hi, Mary. Good to talk to you, and thanks for having me on the show again. Anytime. We're happy to have you back. We're really excited to get into it. Um, so everyone kind of already knows your background a little bit since you've been on the show. Um, they're probably familiar with PackSafe. What is kind of one of the uh, what's kind of the best way to assess risk that comes with those cold chain issues? Like, what's one of the best ways to assess that risk on a bigger scale for shippers? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Mary. Um, you know, when I when I think about your question, I think I would first look at bucketing risk into a couple of major groupings. First, I would look backwards into your history 
and understand where are your hot spots, where, where are you having trouble with delays, where are there dwell points that are taking longer than normal. I like to call that aggregate risk. That information is, is more for strategic leaders so that they can make better trade-off decisions and make decisions that avoid or eliminate risk altogether. Now, there's a second uh, major grouping that I would consider, which would be looking at what's happening right now. So obviously, you're going to have shipments in, in live action, and you need to be able to quantify and understand what the risks are for your shipments and which ones you have to intervene on. So that would be called live risk. Okay, so it's kind of like it's more than just like we have a risk that, you know, something's going to go wrong and we're going to lose our shipment. There's that two different kinds. Um, so kind of, I guess, what would you classify into those? How would you kind of break down and know what classification you fall into within those two different areas of risks? Yeah, yeah, sure. So when you're a strategic leader and you're uh, looking to make uh, proactive decisions and avoid risk, you, you, you first start with aggregate risk. Now, some of the types of specific risks that are going to be most important for logistics, and there's a, a number, but I'll name the top three, would be, for instance, one would be um, transport risk. And what you would want to consider are, for instance, on your particular lanes, how are you performing overall and how are you trending? Are you now more often having delays more than general? Uh, and is that beginning to cause problems? Um, you can also look from a transport perspective on what type of lane or leg it is. For instance, we know from our data and our customers' results that air shipments have a lot less risk than uh, being at a static dwell point. So based on uh, understanding where your shipments are going, uh, the type, types of moves that they're gonna have, uh, you can better understand your, your aggregate risk. Live is a little bit different where, um, you know, we like to say that not all risk is created equal. So when you're in an intervention team, and you need to make decisions as to whether or not to uh, really go after a, a, a situation and address a problem, you want to know more than just if the shipment's late or if the temperature is a little high. Uh, we, we like to make sure that our customers are looking at it from a lens of the potential risk to product loss. Um, so for instance, you might have two shipments that are late, but one product has uh, been in a temperature excursion for um, five hours and one has just started getting an excursion. Um, and your understanding of where those shipments are, the remaining stability budget of those products is, is critical to force rank which ones are more important to address than others. Okay, so it's kind of like uh, if I'm shipping something via boat, I'm really going to hope that there's enough stuff packed in there and that, you know, maybe that guy that packed it or, you know, is the expert in knowing, oh, yeah, it usually takes about a week for a boat to go. So we'll pack it with about a week's worth of stuff. But I mean, like we saw, we aren't, we aren't seeing it right now, but like we saw earlier uh, last year with all those like 100 boats boats waiting to get port. Um, a lot of, I'm sure there was quite a lot of damaged product and, you know, people lost some stuff because they only packed it for like a week or so. Um, cause there's not really like a standardization for that. So, um, I guess it's kind of the, like, how much do you trust, you know, John, who's maybe done this for 30 years versus, um, you know, someone that has the data and knows that like, no, like if you're shipping it via air, you're good. You're probably not going to run into that many issues versus like, you're going to hope that the boat is on time and that, you know, there's no delays getting to port and getting unloaded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And in when you ship cold chain, there's additional considerations that you have to make and important decisions that go into, into uh, those considerations. For instance, what kind of packaging are you going to use? Um, do I need additional protection because of seasonality? Um, what, what kind of, um, uh, equipment have I selected to ensure that this shipment's going to make it on time in the right conditions and in the right um, in, in the right time. Uh, and so uh, it's it's important to note that today supply chain leaders are often making these decisions based on old data and best assumptions as to how long things take to get from point A to B. Um, and so we we coach our customers to that are already using real time solutions to get beyond just looking at the dot on the map of where their product is, but beginning to explore platforms like ours that offer aggregate risk that help teams understand where exactly those hotspots are, how are they trending so they have more fresh information, be able to make highly accurate predictions that'll knock you off your feet, but then more importantly, help auto-prioritize for intervention teams what to look at. All this visibility data that's being generated 
creates a ton more of um, ton more things for people to look at, and we see that it is not as a human problem, but as a machine problem. So that's kind of where we just saw kind of a demo of what you guys do. Um, that's kind of where I guess we can introduce our introducing AI to kind of optimize and, you know, not necessarily just rely on one guy who's done it for forever and his gut feeling. You can create a standard process and you can use and you can leverage artificial intelligence to make sure that, you know, you're mitigating risk the best way that you can, because otherwise you're just left with a bunch of products that, are damaged or potentially at risk of spoilage. Yeah, that, that's right. And the gut feel often doesn't allow for buffer where you can handle some of these disruptions that you're, you're going to face, right? And whether you are a, a shipper of cold chain goods or uh, shipping uh, things internationally, you can understand where delays happen. Uh, it might be weather delay. It might be just an, a transit delay. You missed a flight. And when you're basing everything on your best estimate or old data or your gut feel, <laughs> when you have a situation like this, it, it, there, there's just not enough buffer, especially in cold chain, to manage the deviation and be able to confirm that that product's going to be able to be released for customer. And that's why I think you see so much more spoilage within cold chain. Um, and, and I see the emergence of companies beginning to move to real-time data and, and exploit that real-time data through AI to be able to generate aggregate live risk and predictions is going to is going to be the point where you see it as a game changer where we'll start reducing uh, that overall volume of spoiled product i kind of like it you can use the data and like because it's already there like you already have the data you can just finally turn it and use it to your advantage where for example if you know that you know, when I ship it out of Chicago via the air and I nine times out of 10, I'm going to be delayed a day or two. Well, then I know to, you know, pack it a little extra and maybe leave a much larger buffer versus somewhere where I'll drive it. It'll sit on the tarmac for maybe 20 minutes and then it'll get on a plane and then be where it needs to be like faster than anything else. So I like that that's kind of an option now for some of those cold chain shippers that, you know, for so long have just relied on, you know, um, grassroots and just industry knowledge and just one guy who's been there for forever. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but you know, it is 2023. We kind of need to, to get some technology to help it where that way, if that guy happens to be off that day, you know, you can still send stuff out and you can still have a functioning business. So I definitely mm-hmm. think that that's, something that we can look forward to in the future as it grows. Um, have you guys had any like really big success stories that come out of, you know, utilizing this technology and making sure that, you know, product doesn't get spoilage and have you been able to like actually hear from your customers how much they haven't, or they've saved from spoilage? Absolutely. Um, A a couple of good examples recently that we were working through um, starts with that whole story from looking at aggregate risk first. We're working with a customer looking at various lanes on their network. We pointed out a particular route that was a lot of pain, the particular leg on that route that was driving more of the risk. We showed them through the data that that lane had begun to have longer and longer transit times over the past three months. So we spent a lot of time uh, slicing and dicing the data to try to really have them uh, internalize what's happening and how the data is showing them that. But it was only until we saw then a live situation happen that it really hit home. They had a delay. They had an alarm from a sensor saying that there was a temperature excursion. As we dived in, we saw that it was that precise leg on that precise route we, we described. And what was great was that we were able to predict through our uh, prediction models that a temperature excursion would happen, would happen, and we knew how long it would now take to get to the final destination. So this whole um, span of new information on the situation helped the team be able to orchestrate labor to uh, receive the shipment, uh, put it away, and address it because there was a known shipping uh, temperature excursion uh, in transit. But then it also now caused that secondary conversation about what's happening at that leg on that route to try to resolve it uh, once and for all. Um, so it, it, it's very real that with real-time data and prediction models and, and risk models, you could truly um, begin to automate how you look at a lane strategically, make decisions beforehand to avoid risk, and then on the ground, predict and prevent issues. 
I like that. It's kind of the, um, you know, you kind of are saying like, well, you know, we can help you. And it's not just like, well, here's a problem. Guess we're going to have to do like, guess this is just happening to us. It's kind of taking action and having some agency over everything and saying like, oh, okay, we have this problem. We see it coming. We can adapt on our end to make sure that it's hap- that we're able to receive it. So kind of going into that, you know, knowing that risk is so great, how can someone actually, you kind of touched on it a little bit in your story, but how can you actually like take action to prevent loss? And at that same rate, like who's the most responsible for it? Is it coming down to shippers, carriers, brokers? Like how does that, how does, like who ultimately at the end of the day has the highest responsibility to preventing some of this risk or is it just split Mm -hmm. among all three? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I do think it's spread across all parties and each party does have a, a specific responsibility depending on where the product is in the flow of the goods. So I would suggest that leaders that are in planning, uh, transportation, or uh, the amount of stock they have need to really be understanding the uh, true cycle times from hop to hop in their lanes and understand the ramifications of trade-off decisions on what what routes and um, uh, even carriers are selected to move their goods with respect to risk. Um, at the same time, the carriers themselves, being, the, being that this information is available, they're accountable when the possession of the goods is in their hands to react to those alerts. Um, I, I see more and more of the industry is, um, especially with platforms like ours, making these alerts available via API. Uh, carriers need to be able to subscribe to this information and take action on behalf of their, um, their shippers. And we're hearing the shipper is uh, demanding that from the carriers. Um, and then finally... I would say that um, whether it's an internal shippers intervention team or a third party intervention team, they have to acknowledge now. And I've heard it more and more that you, you can't look at 10 shipments, nevertheless, a thousand shipments on a screen effectively and pinpoint the one data point that tells you something's wrong. They have to take advantage of AI power tools like our live risk to tell them which of the handful of shipments uh, amidst a thousand they have to look at at the time are the ones, are the ones they need to address. And that's the way that the entire ecosystem is going to be able to prevent um, those issues, identify the ones that are happening in real time, and then actually um, address the issue before it has impact to, to product. I wish that I could have had, like back in my day, if I sat down at my desk and started my day and it said, hey, you're going to have a problem with these five shipments, you should probably just go ahead and work on those now and, you know, try to meet that problem head on so that way it doesn't blow up in your face halfway through lunch. I would have killed, (laughs) I would have paid aggressive money for that because otherwise you sit down, you just start working on your day. And then as the morning goes on, well, suddenly there, there might be a problem here, there might not, or... Um, oh, suddenly someone didn't get loaded enough and they closed the dock doors and they thought that they were going to be able to make it in six hours before the product spoiled. But uh, he took a long time scaling out and took a long time getting out of here. So unless he doesn't make there in two hours, we have to bring him back, chill everything down again, and then we can send him off. And the amount of times that I spent just calling people going, please have your driver back back up to the dock door so we can open the doors and have it re-cool off because of course this is a dry van, but the shipment's only like three hours away. So any other time it would be fine, but because it took so long for them to get loaded and for them to get off because the warehouse was doing whatever they were doing, your driver now has to go sit back at the dock for like an hour. And then that's just more detention that like, you know, we as a shipper had to pay out. And it was one of those where I was sat, I sat there and I was like, you guys have to come up with a better solution. That's not just me calling the driver saying, please back it back up to the dock door because there's been a mistake again. And it was always, unfortunately, like the same four carriers it would happen to. And I was like, look, I don't know what's happening. I don't know why it's only you guys. You guys are literally doing nothing wrong. I don't know if it's just, they happen to be putting a new person there, but it was one of those that it's just, it's, uh, I wish I could have gone back in time and had this technology at my fingertips to know, oh, I'm going to have a problem with these. I'm just going to go ahead and get ahead of them now because then my shipper's not angry. My sh- I don't have 500 people calling me going, what's wrong? Why isn't this going? Like, why can't this happen? And you're just like, no, no, no. I solved the problem before it became a problem because nobody likes to be screamed at by 10 different people in the day, in the morning. Yeah. 
That, that, absolutely. And, and uh, what I would tell you is don't, don't be fooled that just getting a sensor to find out where it is, is a solution. Uh, many times our customers think that engaging in IoT and tracking pallets and shipments, that all of a sudden their excursions will go away, that they won't have any late shipments. But in fact, you just have a lot more data to look at. And it's only through having AI powered platforms to tell you what's important with on, within all that data is how you get ahead of those problems and be able to really orchestrate labor, avoid product loss, and make those strategic decisions beforehand, like you mentioned, uh, because you see the patterns, but now the system is clearly through data uh, confirming that um, those specific issues are valid and, and when to react to them. I like it. It's You have now more data points to tell you where something is going wrong. So you have almost more problems to fix, but um, but kind of all one problem. I like it. There's just, here's all of the problems that are happening mm -hmm. instead of just someone calling you, screaming, you saying, where's my shipment? Why is it not cold anymore? Um, so for you kind of touched on it a little bit. So for those carriers who are maybe unwilling to, because you know, if you're not already set up for API, if you're kind of a small to medium sized carrier and you're not making those API calls and maybe it's a little expensive to set it up or you don't see the value in that technology um, and that expense in technology, what's kind of the biggest piece of advice that you can give some of those carriers that are hesitant to getting to maybe signing that check for a big price tag? The, the shippers are asking for it and they're starting to put it in their contracts that they, they expect it. The, the, the value is beyond the tactical for the shippers. It's, it's beyond knowing when it'll arrive. We're seeing shippers using the information and um, information like our predictive ETAs that come from this data to pump it into their own customer systems and have their, their end customers orchestrate um, shipping out and, and be able to handle the product themselves. And we're seeing that the information is being used to reduce calls to call centers at customers because they, they have now a tracking link, they have a, an ETA that's highly accurate that they can have confidence and share with their customer. So this, this whole thought of um, simplifying, reducing the fat and the overhead and supply chain, avoiding product loss is gonna be demanded more, more and more by shippers. And they're gonna go towards the carriers that have it. I think that it's kind of, um the it's one of those where like it's it's happening you either need to get on board with it or just maybe not do this anymore i think that is one of the downsides of that end to end visibility is that you know down for to the driver to even the customer like the shipper's end user they are all part of that that supply chain visibility thing which is great except when something goes wrong then it's not right. so great um, so we are running out of time today on the show and there is this question that we've kind of started. You might, you didn't get it before because Sydney wasn't exactly, Sydney didn't have a little whimsical question, which is fine. We have with the changing of the guard, we've implemented a whimsical question. Are you ready for it? It's pretty, it's pretty I'm hot ready. topic. All right. Do you think that cereal is a soup? Ooh, all right. Uh, that's a, that's a polarizing question. All right. Well, you know, I, I know there's there's people I know that'll say that um, soup's got to be hot and maybe some will say that, you know, you can't have cereal for dinner. But uh, as for me, I think cereal is soup. I've, I've had it for dinner and I've had a gazpacho. So I'm going to tell you cereal is soup. <laughs> OK. All right. I am team cereal is not soup, but I do respect where you're coming from just because it gets so soggy. And I'm not I'm also not a big soup person. Um, and I am I will admit this. I am a monster who eats cereal without milk. So um, to <laughs> me, it's just, you know husks of dried sugar <laughs> <laughs> but i mean you know there's creamy soups and everything That's like right. that it's, there's just a little bit of everything so I, I see where you're coming from but i yeah. do not agree but that's okay that's the beauty of the 2023 we can just not agree on cereal as a soup <laughs> so and that's okay so and Exactly. Uh, speaking of being friends, if anyone wants to find you outside of the show to get your opinion on, um, you know, soup or, you know, some of those yeah. AI insights to cold chain, where can they find you? You can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, you can uh, uh, f find me there and, and comment on some of the videos I'm posting about cold chain and visibility. Uh, PaxSafe will also be out in Las Vegas next week at the Manifest Conference. So feel free to stop by our booth, meet the team and learn a little bit more about how we're helping supply chain companies take advantage of the data that they already have. 
If I had a dollar for every time someone told me that they were going to manifest literally in the last week alone, (laughs) I would have enough money to buy like four manifest registrations. (laughs) Um, But that's exciting. I'm really excited. Uh, I will not be at manifest, but we do have some amazing freight waves people there. So check out PackSafe, check out some of those guys. And don't forget that you can check out additional episodes of running on ice right here on freight waves, TV, YouTube, or anywhere you get your podcasts, such as Apple podcasts and Spotify. If you need more running on ice noobs news, you can subscribe to the newsletter on freightwaves.com slash running on ice. In the meantime, see you on the internet.